everyone and it's great to see such a wonderful crowd here um, a sustained effort for the whole day but i think it's very beneficial to us all and um, i think our presentation to some extent is quite complementary to barry's because and i should say straight away that we are great devotees of the national inventory of architectural heritage and as barry mentioned about the cooperation with the folks in the north, we have worked a lot with the inventory because when we started our survey work on the landed estates 15 years ago, the inventory was going on at the time as well. And they had worked on some of the counties um, that we had yet to work on. Um, and they had photographed houses and estate architecture. And then in turn, they were working on counties which we had surveyed, so they were able to pinpoint sites that they should visit and so on and we've used many of their photographs in our database which i hope you're all familiar with and if you're not familiar with it i'm not going to be showing it to you today but you can go off and look at it afterwards it's landedestates.ie it's a very simple uh, website address so you can find it afterwards but i think a lot of people are used to using it at this stage so this one was a bit of a challenge for us because we had to focus on a specific area uh, to look at the carob and an area of course with which we're both very familiar but it's amazing how when you have to focus on somewhere you maybe see things that you you didn't see before or whatever so um i should go back for a minute there and just mention of course i was delighted to see barry showing the the wonderful ordnance survey um especially as he said the first edition and the 25 inch maps which you could spend all day looking at really and and seeing things um, that you hadn't seen before and completely by chance the image that we have up here is from the first edition um, and that wonderful uh, water colored first edition that shows the townland boundaries in the pink lines which is absolutely amazing but i had never noticed until i looked at this image last night in fact that it shows a ferry going across between Menlo Castle and Dangan. Now, it's Dangan House, but it's not the Dangan House, if those of you who are familiar with the nurseries now, um, there is a, a house called Dangan Cottage on the first edition, and that's the house we know now as Dangan House. The, the Dangan House on this map is actually very close to the water, but there is a ferry uh, going across between the two, and I had never noticed that word ferry until I looked at that that image last night so as i said you, you learn something every time you look at, at a thing you know um but these these maps are hugely important to us uh, in our survey work because it's one of the crucial ways that we identify uh, the well particularly the houses and estate architecture that go with the the uh, estates that we're surveying so to talk about a bit more or to hone in i suppose on the car of a bit more uh, what I did here was I, I focused on the five baronies that uh, bought the carob, and um, then we looked a bit at the, the numbers of houses. It's very difficult to quantify numbers of estates because, of course, the, there are some that are completely contained within one area, and then there are some estates that have land all over the place and it's quite difficult to count the number of estates in any barony if you like so what I did was I actually focused on the houses as we'll see in the next slide which you can see here the, the baronies so there's uh, to the west of the lake is the enormous barony of my Cullen, and to the north of that the barony of Ross um, northeast of the lake is the barony of Kilmaine which is in County Mayo and then most of the east of the Carob is the Barony of Clare, which again is a very large barony. And then a little bit of the Barony of Galway, uh, really where the river, of course, comes through and part of the lake. Um, the Barony of Dunkellen kind of loses out a bit in that it doesn't actually touch the lake, but it's, there are quite a lot of houses that would be relatively close to the Carob uh, in the Barony of Dunkellen as well, just to the southeast there. But um, they were the baronies that I looked at for this. Um, and then I did some work on the houses that are in, that we have on our database, I should say, rather than all of the houses that we're in. And when I'm talking about houses, for the purposes of our database, we use houses that have greater than £10 valuation in Griffith's valuation. So for anyone who doesn't know, Griffith's valuation was, for Galway anyway, it dates from 1855. So the work would, the valuation work would have been done 
sometime in the mid 1850s. And so the houses that had been ascribed a £10 valuation, now that's a substantial valuation, you're talking about a pretty big house. Uh, we do include other houses that may not have £10 valuation, either because we know that it, you know, they, they were the people who were occupying the house were part of a bigger estate system, and some of the very big estates had a lot of houses attached to them. Secondly, we would be aware of houses which didn't have a £10 valuation by the time of Griffiths, but which were very significant houses, maybe 50 or 80 years earlier. And we would ascertain that by some other sources, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, and then we do, of course, have houses which weren't built at the time of Griffiths and then which appeared later on. Um, but many of them we can pick up by later surveys, maybe particularly the untenanted domain survey that occurs in 1906 or was published in 1906. So we have a number of different ways of uh, deciding what houses are included. So just the figures are not that significant, really. But you can see that in the uh, Barony of Galway, and I wasn't counting houses in the city there really now. Uh, we were talking about 27 houses. The Barony of Moycullen, we had 26. The Barony of Ross, we had 12. And then very interestingly, in the whole of the Barony of Kilmaine, there were 62. And in the whole of the Barony of Clare, and I was struck by what Michael mentioned much earlier in the day about the difference between East and West. And, you know, you can see straight away, of course, that the, many of the houses are in the baronies with the really good land in Kil Kilmaine and Clare and not in, in perhaps in the barony of Ross or whatever. So, so they, the pattern that maybe became established in a much earlier period continues through the uh, period when the estates are significant within the landscape. And of course, up until the late 19th and early 20th century, everybody was living on an estate, either as the estate owner or an estate worker or a tenant of the estate. So the estate underpinned the economy of the area. So as I said earlier, um, there were ways of finding out, you know, who had lived in a specific house and one of the ways we used was um, these are amongst kind of well the earliest useful maps for our purposes anyway uh, the Taylor and Skinner uh, maps of the roads of Ireland which was published the first edition was published in 1777 and happily for us uh, it includes the names of big houses as you're going along a road but it also includes the name of the occupant at the time so of course that points you know it, it places a house in now it doesn't necessarily mean they were the owners of the house and we, we found that in many cases people rented houses over periods of time and there was a great deal of comings and goings sometimes between house owners too so it's probably too difficult for you to read that there but it's a portion of the road just going out through Bushy Park and and a little bit beyond Dangan going through Bushy Park and uh, there are quite a number of houses some of which have disappeared um, or else been renamed by the, the time of the first edition ordinance map, which was roughly 50 years later, you know. Um, and the one, the map on the right hand side is the northern side of Moy Cullen. So again, just as you'd be leaving the village of Moy Cullen going towards Oop Gerard. So for example, the, the house that we know still, and it's still there, Drim Kong house, uh, it was occupied by a Lynch family. It, at the time that the uh, road atlas was constructed. But interestingly, there is another house called Kilkelly, also occupied by Lynch's at that time. And then further out is the house we know as the Martin House at Ross. So this was a very important source for us, as I said, because it places people and a house um, together, you know. And then uh, if we move on to the other side of the lake, the eastern side of the lake, again, we see the same sort of thing. So up here is Clare Galway village, and then it's the um, area going towards Corundulla, going towards the lake, really. So you have the Staunton house at Waterdale there, for example, is one of the houses. And then this part here is almost up at Kong. So Ashford is just down here at the bottom of the map. At Ashford was occupied by the Brown family at that time and so on. So this was a way for us to establish a, a chronology of 
the occupancy of a house, you know. Um, and the Taylor and Skinner, uh, they're, they're, it was reprinted in 1969 by the Irish University Press, and that reprinted edition is widely available in certainly in local studies libraries anyway, but it's been digitized now by a number of different sources. So you can look at it. It's not the easiest thing in the world to look at online. I'd have to say, um, if, if you can go and look at it in a library, I would recommend that you do so because it's not, not all that easy to use online. It's, it's one of those sources. And then just looking a bit at the size of the estate. And of course, again, there are quite a number of sources that you know, you can work out the size of an estate. One of the most important um, sources for us is a survey that was carried out in the 1870s. Um, and this, of course, was it was a parliamentary survey. It was published as a parliamentary paper. And it's known as the return of owners of one acre and upwards in Ireland. Um, again, it was published as a parliamentary paper in 1876. And it, was, it has been reprinted by... Um, the genealogical publishing company in Baltimore in the United States, I think in the late 1980s. And that reprinted version is widely available in reference libraries as well. And it's arranged county by county and you can see the names of the people who owned the, the land, right from people who did happen to own one or a couple of acres, right up to the, the largest estates in the county. Um, and in County Galway, and because of course it has a bearing on the Carob region, uh, the largest estate was originally a Martin estate, um, and it would be centred certainly in the later 19th century uh, on Balnehinch Castle, as we know today, the, the hotel. But it ceased to be a Martin estate in the late 1840s and 1849. Um, when, well, Thomas Martin had died and his daughter inherited, but then she died as well. It was eventually sold because it was indebted um, and it was purchased by a company called the Law Life Assurance Company. Um, and then later on by the Berridge family. It, it has a long and pretty well documented history. In 1873, it was recorded as being 159,000 acres. But it didn't have as high valuation as some of the estates in East Galway would have had because, of course, much of the 159,000 acres was a sporting estate rather than a farming estate. Uh, on the other side of the lake, then, for example, Sir Arthur Guinness's estate at Ashford, uh, which would have been in the ownership of the Guinness family by the 1870s, that was 21,000 acres. Uh, some of the estates in East Galway, like Lord Clancarty and the Clan Rickard and those, they would have been up in the 20 and 30,000 acres as well. But it didn't always necessarily mean that the people who owned the smaller estates, you know, didn't have a part to play. So, for example, going back to the Blakes in Menlo that Barry was talking about earlier, uh, Sir Thomas Blake had 3,800 acres in 1873. So a not insignificant amount of land. The Lynches or the Lynch Stauntons in Clyde, and Clyde was mentioned earlier as well, they had 1,300 acres. Or Anthony O'Flaherty's estate in Knockban, which was between my column and Oak Gerard, was 1,500 acres. But Anthony O'Flaherty was an MP for Galway and a very significant player in the kind of Catholic landowners um, area and a great friend of Daniel O'Connell. So, you know, you can't always equate the size of an estate with necessarily the influence or other that was conducted by the owner. We know, of course, that through the 19th century and particularly through the latter half of the 19th century, uh, there were quite a lot of changes in ownership and you know, we could go on about this for quite a long time, but I won't labour the point. But um, probably the most significant body uh, was that which was set up after the famine to sell estates that were bankrupt. So it was originally known as the Encumbered Estates Court. And then in 1858, it became known as the Landed Estates Court. And it continued in existence uh, up until the 1880s. And then it became part of the Land Judges Court. But it created a body of printed material that is very significant for, um, you know, tracing the history both of the estates and indeed to go back to 
um, you know, the, the vernacular history as well, because it's quite important in that it frequently lists the, the people who were living on the estate at the time and the nature of their tenancy. But before that, in the earlier part, you still got, you always got a certain amount of changing and sale of land and so on. So this map here is a small excerpt from Larkin's map of Galway, which was surveyed, I think, maybe from about 1810, but it wasn't published until 1819. And it would have been surveyed um, at the request of the, the grand jury at the time. And uh, Larkin did a number of these maps in different parts of Ireland. But this little excerpt here, again, it shows the that Lynch estate that I mentioned earlier at Drim Kong. And I just mentioned Drim Kong because I think a lot of people might know where Drim Kong is because the restaurant used to be there. But that had divided into uh, the Kilkelly family had taken over where Drim Kong itself is. And a Burke estate had been created at Danesfield, which was right on the outskirts of my Cullen village as we know it now. Um, and from the original Lynch of Drim Kong estate. And uh, the, the Burke estate is significant, of course, because the, one of the daughters of that family eventually becomes the Countess of Fingal. And she wrote a, a, a biography, called, it's called The 70 Years Young. And there's a lot of information in her biography about growing up on what was a relatively small landed estate in the Carib area in the latter part of the 19th century. So, you know, as a source, it's, it's useful and we shouldn't Obviously, it's a subjective account and you have to take it in, in that um, light. But nevertheless, it's, it's, you know, those sort of sources are very important as well. So it's a good one to mention. Um, now, you're not going to be able to see this, of course, but I was, uh, again, pleased when I saw what Barry had put up there. And it mentioned one of the, the focus areas that he was looking at in his vernacular study was the village of Tonnebrookie. Um, and this is part of the sale notice from the Martin estate in 1852. And it lists the occupants of the townland of Tunnebrookie at the time. And it's telling us, of course, as well, the, the nature of their tenancy, which was entirely from year to year. In other words, you know, they didn't really have leases and they had very little in the way of security of tenure or anything like that. But um, those sort of sources, so it's 1852, it's actually before Griffiths, just before Griffiths. Um, but it gives, and because there were quite a number of people with the same surname, it often gives the patronymic, you know, the, the name by which people would know that family to distinguish them from another family of the same surname, uh, which you don't get always in Griffiths. Anyway, you do sometimes, but not always. So those sale notices which were produced to um, you know, accompany the encumbered estates court sales, they're really important because of the documentation and the information that they give. They often have maps included as well. And sometimes for our purposes, they would have images of the houses, um, you know, drawings of the houses. Um, and some of those houses are completely gone. Like for example, the one there at Waterdale that I mentioned earlier outside Clare Galway. Waterdale is completely gone and all we have is that drawing from the uh, encumbered estates sale notice. So there now they have been there. There are sets of the originals of those in the National Library and in the National Archives and several other places. They have been digitized and you can access them through both Ancestry and Find My Past, uh, which are genealogical um, subscription sites. Again, they're not the easiest things to use online, but you know it's, it's still better than nothing. Uh, and I know Bridget is going to mention some, uh, there are printed copies of some of them in Galway County Library as well, and Bridget's going to mention those. Oh, sorry, I skipped one there. So the other thing is, of course, um, the accounts written by travelers and people to the area at different times. and. I couldn't talk about Loch Horeb without mentioning um, William Wilde, and I'm surprised he hasn't been mentioned more than, than uh, I thought he would be mentioned more today than he has been. But uh, William Wilde was, of course, he's probably not as well known now as Oscar, his son, but uh, he was an extraordinary character in that he was a doctor by occupation, but he, he had lots of other strings to his bow as well. But he wrote the... Um, the Guide to the Loch Carib, its Shores and Islands, which he originally published in 1867. And again, it's really important for us from, from our perspective because 
he, he makes reference, he's doing the tour around the Caravan a steamer, uh, which, you know, highlights how important the car was as a transport route, of course, in the 19th century. But also he makes constant reference to the house or domain that he's passing in a very kind of casual way, because, of course, they were part of the, you know, what you were passing. He's, he's not going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Unless that there's something of great significance about it. Or, uh, for example, when he passes by... Um, the site at Anakin, the, the Hall House at Anakin near Hedford, uh, he mentions that there was a, a house being constructed there which wasn't finished and, uh, and the name of the owner and things like that. So you can get that sort of incidental information through the descriptions of, of travellers like William Wilde. And um, he's quite scathing here in this quote. He's talking about the, the law life estates. Now that was the Martin estate which had been sold in 1852 and purchased by the Law Life Assurance Company. And he says, though it was bought exceedingly cheap at a time when Irish property was pressed into the market at a third less than its value, no portion of Ireland of the same extent has made less progress in the last 20 years. So he's not complimentary to the Law Life Assurance as landowners, certainly in that case. Um, and in, included in his book are some engravings of buildings, of course, that most of the engravings are of archaeological monuments, but this is an image of Lemonfield House uh, near Oakterard. Now, I know Oakterard Heritage have some very fine photographs of Lemonfield, which is gone now as well, but um, they have some very fine photographs on the website, but this is the engraving from, from Wilde's book. So again, it gives us, you know, an, an idea of how the house would have looked, and uh, that house was there until well into the 20th century, of course. And the last uh, printed source that I'm going to mention here for you, and it's a little plug for our uh, digital resources from, from the university library. Um, we purchased this item about 15 years ago, I think now. It's called a Memorial Atlas of Ireland. And I think it's probably one of the earliest, if not the earliest, Atlas of Ireland published in the United States. It was published in Philadelphia in 18, sorry, in 1901. And uh, it's a huge folio size book. And each page is a picture of I an Irish county, but it's beautifully arranged with the baronies and the civil parishes very clearly visualized on the maps. And nowadays it's quite difficult to get sources that will show you either of those two administrative areas because of course they're not used anymore. Um, so the, the Memorial Atlas is really helpful. And again, it does show the names of houses. It also shows you, in the case of the Carib, you can see it's a very crowded map. It shows you the names of all the um, topographical features along the lake as well. So for anyone who has an interest in the Carib, either from a historical or maybe even from an angling or sailing point of view, uh, it, it's very nice to look at. So it's been digitized by the library and it's up on our website. Um, at the moment, it's, it's kind of difficult to find it by going into the library website directly. So if you're looking for it, I would suggest searching Memorial Atlas University Library and you'll get it that way. And I should be able to give you a better um, web address for it, but that's the easiest way to find it at the moment. So I'm going to stop now and Bridget is going to take you through some archival sources, in other words, sources that are not published uh, for the estates around the Carib. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about archival collections um, that document the landed estates and big houses entered in the database that Mary and I compiled for the Moore Institute in the university, using examples from the Corrib region. The main emphasis of the landed estates database project has been to identify original records for the estates we have entered in the database if they survive and their location. Tracing these records has become much easier since we began this project because so much more information is available online through the digitization of collection catalogs and enhanced word searching. 
Archival sources in the database include estate administration records, which may contain some family papers, solicitors and land agent records, the sale rentals of the land courts, which Mary has already mentioned, genealogical material and photographs. Most of these collections are located in the National Library, the National Archives, the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland, and in repositories in England and Wales. A few remain in private hands, and some are located in university and county libraries. For example, the archive section of the James Hardiman Library at the university here in Galway has record collections for quite a number of estates. Those in the Corrib area include the Wilson Lynches of Renmore and Duras, and that of the Kerwins of Dalgan near Chum, who were land agents to some estates close to the Corrib. Um, Galway County Library has over 30 rentals of the land courts, while the County Archives Service has records relating to a number of estates, including those near Hedford of the Lynch Stauntons of Clydia, the Burks of Hour, and also a leather-bound gilt-edged volume with maps and descriptions of the St. George Mansour estate at Hedford. Repositories like the National Library and the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland have been active in microfilming collections still held privately. The records of the Fitzgerald Kenny family of Kilclocher, County Galway, are an example. Besides containing title deeds and military and legal papers, this collection also contains 18th century deeds of the Skerritt family of Ballinduff on the shore of Loch Corrib, near Hedford. This collection demonstrates how records of one estate can sometimes be found within the records of another. Archives concerning Irish landed estates can also be found in repositories in the UK. These tend to be either a single or a small number of items, often contained within a larger collection relating to English estates. The London Metropolitan Archives hold a document entitled Particulars of the Martin Estate to be sold at the London Auction Mart in August 1849. So Mary has already mentioned this rental and actually the estate wasn't sold until 1852. This vast estate west of the Corrib with its big house by the Hinch was bought by the Law Life Assurance Company. Another example, this time of the collection of about 600 items concerning the Kong Abbey estate in the 17th and 18th centuries, is located in the Lancashire archives at Preston among a huge collection of records relating to the Gerard family of Lancashire. Some families still retain the records of their former estates for example, some of the Clements family archive, which includes records of the Ross Hill estate at Clonbur, only a couple of miles from the shore of Loch Corrib, remain in the possession of the family in County Kildare, while the financial minute books of the Law Life Assurance Company, as already mentioned, are still retained by the Phoenix Assurance Company in London. The records of solicitors and land agents' offices are another important source for those interested in landed estates. Many solicitors served a dual role as both legal advisor and land agent to a particular estate, and their collections can contain large amounts of information about the estates they acted for. This is of particular rele relevance where no estate records have survived. Many solicitors' collections are preserved in the National Archives, as after the fire of 1922, the Public Record Office actively collected material from legal firms. For example, three collections of solicitors' records in the National Archives contain documents relating to the O'Flaherty estate at Lisdunna, near Hedford, including some rentals and accounts from the late 19th century. From the mid-19th century, a branch of the O'Flaherty family leased Liz Dunner from the St. George's, 
and by the 1870s, Martin O'Flaherty of Liz Dunner owned over 2,000 acres in County Galway. Another example, this time of a single item, is a lease of Clunacornine and other lands close to Galway City, dated 1824, from Martin Blake of Brooklawn to Martin and Thomas Cullinan of Clare Galway, which can be found in the solicitor's collection of J. H. Montgomery and Son. Part of a collection belonging to the Kerwins of Dalgan near Chum is located in the University, of Libra University Library Archives here in Galway, while the other part is held in the National Library. These 19th century, early 20th century land agency records, which include deeds and rentals, ledgers of rent receipts, copies of outgoing letters and maps, mainly relate to the Castle Hackett, Ballanderry, Quainsbury, Windfield, Knocknagor, and Ballyglunan estates. Some parts of these estates were located in the Corrib region. For example, the Nolans of Ballanderry held Porta Carron on the western side of the lake near Uttarad, while the Blakes of Ballyglunan held land at Anna Down and in Galway City. Other estates on the eastern shore of Loch Corrib near Hedford, referred to in the Kerwin collection, are those of the Carters of Rinnanoch and Curramore, the Browns of Claren, the Lynch Stauntons of Clyde, and the Teelings of Our. Now, I would just like to give you a few glimpses into the content of some archival collections that document estates in the Corrib region. Rentals are one of the most sought after records in landed estate collections, as the information in a rental includes the name of the denomination of land, the tenant's name, acreage, the amount of rent due, the amount received, arrears, and an observations column, which can be very useful to the family historian, as sometimes there are references to the death of a tenant or his emigration or eviction. This slide is taken from the Leitrim Papers, part of the Clements Archive in the National Library, and is a page from the Ross Hill Rental of 1864, showing the townland of Carrogarraf, situated on the northern shore of Loch Corrib near Man. This second example shows part of a rent roll of the estate of Edward Eyre in Galway City, dating from the beginning of the 19th century and refers to houses in Abbeygate, Market and Shop Streets. The Eyre collection in the University of Galway archives mainly contains leases and other material relating to the management of the property of the Eyre family in Galway City in the 18th and 19th centuries. In the 19th century, it became common practice to use pre-printed leases with the details entered in manuscript hand. This is a lease of part of Suckeen beside the river in Galway from Robert H. Eyre to Patrick Feeney, a boatman, in 1817. One e interesting feature is the inclusion of a map of the holding by Michael Logan, who made the town plan of Galway City in 1818. Patrick Feeney appears to, be, to have been literate in that he signed his own name. Other leases of the same date for properties in Galway are included in the air collection collection, and on the right are the signatures from another lease, which shows two of the leasees signing with their marks or cross. Details of the air documents were published in an article by Marguerite Hayes McCoy in the Journal of the Galway Archaeological and Historical Society in the 1940s, if any of you want to look at them further. One estate close to the Cor, with which I am very familiar, is the Kong Abbey Estate, a substantial land holding of over 7,000 acres, which was held in the early 18th century by George McNamara, on lease from the landlord Henry Tasberg, an English Catholic resident in London. On this slide, you can see the parts of the estate in the parish of Kong, coloured yellow. 
They were quite dispersed and had been acquired by the monks of the abbey in medieval times from various families. A considerable part of the estate was fairly barren hillside in Joyce country, west of Kong, much of it subleased. In 1722, George McNamara, a native of Ard Clooney, County Clare, became the tenant of this estate and four years later is recorded as having 2,200 sheep, 30 cows, 140 yearling cattle and 13 horses on the parts of the estate he farmed himself. He sold cattle in Munster and wool in Dublin. Besides being a substantial farmer, he derived income from a brewery, mills, an eel fishery and forestry. Although based in Kong, the records reveal that he travelled to Dublin and London on a number of occasions and lived in Dublin for a period of time. He was imprisoned in the town of Ballinrobe for over two months at the end of 1723 on false accusation, according to himself. He also served time in Newgate and the King's Bench prisons in London for not paying his rent. He constantly disputed legal matters, going to court with the local Protestant clergy over the payment of tithes and with the landlord for the non-payment of his rent. For certain, he was the most influential person in Kong during the time he lived there. There are four main sources which document George McNamara and his tenancy of the Kong Abbey estate. A printed work mainly relates to the folklore where he is portrayed as a Robin Hood type of character. And there is a manuscript journal and two collections of records in London and Lancashire. The manuscript journal was written by Thomas Tasberg, a Jesuit priest, sent to Ireland in 1726 to see why his brother, Her Henry's, errant tenant, McNamara, was not paying his rent. It is now in the archives of the University of Otago at Dunedin in New Zealand. How it travelled across half the world is unknown, and it is reputed to have been rescued from a skip. It is evident that the journal was kept so that Thomas could report in letters to his brother what happened while he was in Ireland. Some of what he wrote gives interesting snapshots of the workings of the penal laws. For example, he met the Galway landowner, Sir Walter Blake of Menlo, and his wife while in Dublin, and recounts how the Blakes, a Catholic family, had been affected by the penal law measures relating to both gavel kind, which is the division of property among all male heirs, and life tenancies. The two pages from Thomas Tasberg's journal displayed here contain various expenses. For example, on the top of the left-hand page, you can see that there was uh, £3.14 uh, was for the doctor and apothecary in Kong. And the other page recounts his meeting with the, with the Blakes. By far the largest amount of uh, records documenting the life of George McNamara and his Kong Abbey estate are contained in the Gerard collection at the Lancashire Archives in Preston. These include a number of letters written by McNamara himself. And here you can see a letter addressed to the landlord, Henry Tasberg, at Mrs. Harrison's house in Drury Lane against Ye Dog Tavern in London. And it dates from 1700. I'm not sure that it would reach its destination nowadays. The other page is part of a letter written by George McNamara describing in extensive detail the funeral of his wife Ellis in 1736. And she was buried, um, the cortege went from Kong to Ross Early um, Abbey where she was buried. The Jared papers include an account book covering the first six months of 1741. It was kept by Theodorus Drag, who arrived in Dublin in mid-December 1740 as an administrator of the estate, McNamara having been ejected at the end of 1740. In his accounts, Drag recorded who the main tenants were, their acreage, rent, etc. For example, all the tenants of the village of Cross are identified. His letters give extensive details about the agricultural situation in the locality at the time, 
including a shortage of grain in Galway. The cold weather in the winter of 1739-40 was very severe and there were famine conditions in many parts of Ireland during 1740, which extended into the following year, and drag rights of the citizens of Galway being relieved by the arrival of a ship carrying 2,000 barrels of grain. Drag describes the reluctance of the inhabitants of Kong to develop a trading relationship with the Corrib area and Galway city because of their smuggling activities. He writes, at a small distance lies a lake eight English miles over and more than 40 long, affording a clear navigation to the town of Galway. And Kong is the only place on this northwest side of Ireland that has such a communication with the town of Galway. It is surprising the whole country have not made use of such navigation and established Kong, an Ireland port. But I apprehend the tenants of Kong have always discouraged the boatmen of Galway from coming to live amongst them, and indeed hate that their town should have any acquaintance with its neighbourhood, treating all who come amongst them with great incivility as to be unfrequented and retired. Best, best answered a receptacle of highwaymen and smugglers, for harbouring the former of which Mr Mack himself was once tried and not cleared by want of evidence but a slip of the law. You can see there was no love lost between Drag and McNamara. It is very probable that the nearby Marm Valley, where part of the Kong Abbey estate was located, was a smuggling route from the coast at Linan, which the inhabitants of Kong had easy access to. Parts of the Marm Valley also belonged to another estate located on the northern shore of Loch Corrib that is documented but in dispersed locations, the already mentioned Ross Hill estate of the Earls of Leitrim and Charlemont, inherited through marriages with the Birmingham co-heiresses in the early 19th century. Some of the 18th century his history of the Ross Hill estate is documented in the Westport papers in the National Library, as the Birmingham heiresses were descended from a daughter of Colonel John Brown, who built Westport House. When the notorious third Earl of Leitrim died in 1878, he left his Ross Hill estate and Killadoon, a family home near Selbridge, County Kildare, to his cousin, Colonel Theophilus Clements. As previously mentioned, some records remain in the hands of the Clements family, including a journal kept by Colonel Theophilus Clements' wife when they came to inspect the Ross Hill estate in 1880. She writes that they travelled by train from Selbridge to Galway. On the train, she had a chat with a woman who had just visited Knock, the apparition having taken place the previous year. From Galway, they travelled on to Ushurad in a carriage, where they met the estate agent, George Robinson. They continued on to Marm, staying for a few nights in the Marm Inn, which many of you may know as Joe Kane's. Some of their tenants came to see them there, and Mrs. Clements gives a colourful description of the clothing of the women who sat outside knitting socks. They wear petticoats of every shade of crimson, pink, madder, brown and white. This is often tucked up and fastened back, showing another petticoat of a different colour. A white petticoat or a grey shawl is thrown over the head. On leaving the inn at Marm, the Clements went on to Ross Hill visiting Lord Mount Morris and his wife at Eber Hall on the shore of Loch Corrib on their way. Mrs. Clements describes their host as a marvellous specimen of a Lord of Connemara. He dresses in three or four ragged frieze coats, talks with a brogue, is not as temperate as he might be, and chiefly associates with the police. Lord Mount Morris, believed locally to be a Dublin, city, a Dublin castle informant, was murdered in the locality later that year. Such are the records that throw light on life in 18th and 19th century Ireland that can be found in archives documenting landed estates and big houses in the Corrib region. So to conclude, estate archives are important information sources 
for land ownership, landlord tenant relationships, genealogy, local studies, household and estate accounts and management, development of agricultural and farming methods, land agitation, social mores, and the study of individual personalities, such as that of um, Anthony Malcolmson's study of the third Earl of Leitrim and my study of George McNamara. Thank you very much. And I'll just quickly show you the landed estates database. Um, as I said, I'm not doing a live demonstration of it, but this is what the web page looks like. And it's landedestates.ie is, is how you reach it if you're searching for it. Um, and it gives a variety of ways of accessing information about estates, including the names of the, uh, the owners of the estate, or you can search for information about houses on the estate as well. Um, and so there's a search box that you can search for any of those things. Uh, there's a map which lots of people use to, if you're not looking for information about a specific estate, but you're looking for you know, more general information. So um, you can see here, this is the map of Ireland. At the moment, we have information about estates in both Munster and Connacht. Um, but I'm happy to say as well that last year we got a small amount of money from the Heritage Council, which uh, the university has supplemented and it has allowed us to begin some research and survey work on the three Ulster counties of Cabin, Donegal and Monaghan. And we're hoping um, later on this summer that the, uh, the information, we have a lot of the research work done now, but the technical uh, uploading has to happen um, so that, that they will be uploaded hopefully, you know, towards the end of the summer, I think that people will be able to look at uh, information about those counties. And the, each of the uh, estate entry kind of, they're fairly standard. So they include the name of the estate, a short description, the families associated with it, the houses, and as Bridget has highlighted so well there, the, the archival sources relating to an estate and the location of those archival sources. And that was really the motivation for us doing this project at the very beginning was because we were constantly being asked about you know, where there might be information about specific um, estates. So that, that's, that's why we, we did it. And uh, ironically, it's the Blakes of Menlo. Menlo is featuring very much in, in today's proceedings. But uh, the screenshot that I have is, so on the left-hand side, you can see the description of the Blake estate at Menlo and an image on the right there of some of the archival sources. Uh, and of course, very few estates have very complete collections, you know, and, and Menlo would be no different. There are some records relating to Menlo. There are some estates for which there are almost no records available, or at least no archival records anyway. Um, and it can be, you know, it's the luck of the draw really to some extent, but um, the, the database is designed to help as much as we can. Um, and there's always, if there's a house on the estate, we will include an entry like this with an image of the house before Jim got to work on it um, and the locational details. So telling you the townland the house is in, uh, the barony, the civil parish and all of that type of information, which is useful if you're looking, particularly if you're looking at 19th century sources. And we also have a, a handout. It might, they might be gone now because I can't remember how many copies I did. Um, I left them over on the table there. Uh, it's a bibliography of printed sources that most of them are online now. And if anybody wants one, you know, you can get in touch. If, if there aren't enough copies there, you can get in touch about it again. Uh, we also have an email address, which um, you can write to us at landedestates at universityofgalway.ie if you have a specific question about the state that you want to know more about. So thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the seminar. <laughs>